Last week, we celebrated the resurrection of our Savior. We stood in awe of a Redeemer who has defeated sin, conquered death, and changed our eternity. Now, the work of the church begins. It's our time to go and tell the world about Jesus, to let them know they're loved, to show them they're cared for, to be the light of Christ to those around us. The story of Easter is not meant to be kept quiet. This gift is not meant to be kept secret. The love of Jesus, his grace and mercy, the power of his resurrection are meant to be shared with our friends, our families, our communities, our nation, and our world. Today, there is light overcoming darkness, hope destroying hopelessness, victory rising out of defeat, and life rising from the ashes. It's time to climb the mountaintops and proclaim in one loud voice, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to Heritage Church. I want to give a warm welcome to those here in the sanctuary, also to those who are worshiping with us in the ark on the north end of the building, and those of you who are online. So maybe some of you are still enjoying spring break and somewhere else, but hopefully you've hopped on and uh, are watching and uh, worshiping with us this morning. Um, please rise uh, for the call to worship. Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is the day when tears are wiped away and shattered hearts are mended, where fears can be replaced with joy. This is the day the Lord rolls away the stone of fear, throws off death's clothes, goes ahead of us into God's future. This is the day the Lord has made. Death has no fear for us, and sin has lost its power over us. God opens the tombs of our hearts to fill us with new life. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us sing together this morning, holy, holy, holy.
God, we come to you this morning in the light of your resurrection, the gift of your son, the gift of grace and love and mercy. God, we thank you today and we praise you today. Thank you for sending your son to die on our behalf. Thank you that we have a life that we can live in freedom because of that gift. And God, I pray for anyone who is here today who isn't sure what that means. God, I pray that you would surround them with your love today, that you would reveal yourselves to them, and they would know you and love you. God, I pray for those coming today who are hurting or grieving. May you wrap your arms around them and comfort them and give them your peace. God, I pray for those wondering, those who are feeling joyful. God, we thank you for all of those things. And we come before you to praise you, to worship you, our King of Kings. Amen.
So let's take a moment this morning in the light of his resurrection to greet each other, to say good morning, to maybe give a hug. Um, for those of you who are online, please share with us where you are and um, we'd love to hear from you as well. So please take a moment. We'll be taking our offerings for our general fund and our Christian education. So please feel free to give. We were broken, sinful, and wretched. A stain soaked deep into the fabric of humanity. Consumed by death, covered in darkness, lost in the wilderness, set adrift in the vastness. But God, he was consumed too, unwilling to watch his creation wander endlessly, unable to sit by as we dove deeper into the abyss. He was overcome by love, by grace, by mercy. He took our pieces and gave them purpose. He took our shattered spirit and gave it hope. He took our destiny and reshaped it. Though we were unworthy, he counted us worthwhile. We were broken, but in the hands of God, we've been made whole. This is our time of worship where our children get to go to their special time of worship. So if um, there's kids who are four through kindergarten, we are going to pray for you in just a moment. If you are new or visiting, um, we'd love for you to go back with your child so you know where they are and you can collect them at the end of the service. So let's go ahead and pray for our littles and then they can head to their time. Lord, as we go to worship you, may your spirit go with us to Help us listen, pray, and sing that praise to your great name we bring. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, you may head out. Let us bring our thanksgiving and concerns before God in prayer. May the words of our mouth and the med meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, Psalm nineteen fourteen. Father, Son, and Spirit, we come to you to give you our thanks. That is all your grace to please live and come to your sanctuary to worship your holy name, fellowship with brothers and sisters, and enjoy the beautiful weather. Our soul is satisfied only with your spirit, O oh Lord. Without you, we are going to astray and wander in the deserts. Without your grace and provision, 
we're going to be far away from the rivers of living water and lose our lives. Especially we pray to you for our friends and the people we care about. Lord God, please comfort Bab Herberg and her sister Kim Thomas for losing their family in other country. We also bring before you Jim Oppenheisen, who was admitted to hospital with congestive heart failure. Also, we pray for Bid Watsworth, who has now been given a firm date of May 2nd for his heart surgery, and pray for Dave Murder, who went through the surgery for the artery in his drought three days ago. Please give them the courage to live, a miracle that shows that you are our eternal king and you reign our lives. Also, we pray for peace. Let all who think lightly of making war be converted to think strongly of making peace. We pray for people for whom today is another day of trying to find something to eat. For people in our world for whom today is another day lived under the yoke of oppression. For people who have no friends and are desperately lonely. For people who have lost somebody so close to them that they are almost dying with grief. And for people today who are dying. O Spirit, Spirit of Christ, give us a joy that outlets our sorrows. Give us a hope stronger than the despair of our discouragement and give us a new belief that we have reason to rejoice, to be glad for who we are because you made us and gave us life, and all we have is a gift for you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, amen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be looking this morning at the letter of Paul to the Philippians, at chapter 3, uh, the first 14 verses of that chapter. This sermon today is sort of a sequel to Easter Sunday from last week as we continue to reflect on what it means to be the people of the resurrection, who live in the power of that resurrection, people who have been raised with Jesus Christ and what that means for us. So we read Philippians 3, verses 1 through 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who, li who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to yet have taken hold of it, 
But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. There on the screen, you see a sign. Beware of dog, okay? You might find a sign like this one maybe at a junkyard posted to the fence outside the the junkyard area. Beware of dog. But you get a little closer. I don't see a dog. Maybe that sign is a fake. Maybe there's no dog at all. So you inch up a little closer and you're about a foot away from the fence, and all of a sudden, around the corner comes this ferocious-looking dog, and it's baring its teeth, and it's barking furiously. And right then, you make the very sane and wise decision that you're going to stay on the other side of the fence. Beware of the dog. Okay. But what a strange thing to read in the Bible. But that's what Paul says in verse 2, watch out for those dogs. So what's he talking about? Well, he goes on to explain those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. Watch out for the dogs, Paul. Do you mean that? Yes, apparently he did. This is a side to the apostle Paul we're not quite prepared for. It sounds harsh. What a description of people. I suspect that Paul very much intended for it to sound harsh because after Paul had moved on from Philippi and moved on to the next city to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ there, others came along and they said, you know, what Paul told you, nah, he doesn't have it right. You know, I have a di- we have a different message for you. Really, these new Christians said, and it would have included, for example, that Philippian jailer who was there and heard the gospel, the one who was told by Paul and Silas, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. He would have been in that group. But these other teachers came along and said, no, I don't believe it. We have a different message. This is a better one for you. And so what they did is they twisted what Paul had taught them. The good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And they twisted it and they distorted it into what might be called a do-it-yourself message. Faith, is that what Paul told you? All you have to do is believe? Well, no, not really. That's not enough. You can earn salvation. You can make yourself right with God. Here's a list of rules. Here are things you need to do. Here's the checklist. Follow these lists, this list meticulously. Forget what Paul taught you and listen to us. And the Apostle Paul would call that putting your confidence in the flesh. Putting your confidence in the flesh. Paul understood that kind of thinking because that's what he grew up with. That's the way he himself used to think. Paul was someone who was always putting his confidence in the flesh until, of course, he met Jesus Christ. Or or miraculously, you would say that Jesus Christ met him. The risen Savior stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus, and he put Paul on a resurrection track instead. And, And meeting Jesus Christ does that for people, right? In fact, I would hope all of us would say, you know, Jesus Christ did that for me. He did that for us, too. By Easter evening, a lot of people were trying to catch their breath. Have you ever noticed just how much running (laughs) took place on Easter Sunday? In Matthew 28, the angel said, now go quickly and tell the disciples he has risen from the dead. And the women took off and they weren't used to running and they were huffing and puffing as they traveled on that path back into the city of Jerusalem and they were afraid and yet filled with joy and they ran 
to tell the disciples. That's Matthew's version on running. John has one too. The apostle John wrote this in John chapter 20 that both he and Peter ran to the tomb to see these things from the past, uh, that the women had told them about, to see that that had indeed come to pass, that the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. And in Luke's version of Easter, the two disciples who made their way with Jesus to Emmaus, and they had this relatively leisurely walk uh, from that seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and then Jesus came into their home and he broke the bread and it finally dawned on them, this is Jesus. Jesus is alive again. And, and so they ran back. They, yes, they ran too and they ran back to Jerusalem those seven miles and they came in sweating and huffing and puffing. He's alive all right. He's alive all right because we recognized him when he broke bread. All this running on Easter Sunday. And one might call it Resurrection momentum. How many of you have been following basketball? What's wrong with you people who don't have your hand up? This has been fun. You know, what, that's, no, that's okay. You don't have to like basketball, but it has been kind of fun. Go Caitlin Cullen, uh, Clark, rather, and, and we hope, uh, well, we'll see who wins that game today. But March Madness, we call it, right? And, and if you watch basketball games, there's often an ebb or a flow to, that, to the game, right? And all of a sudden, one team will get hot. They'll hit a couple of three-pointers, maybe they'll get a couple of turnovers, and they go on a 12-0 run. And the announcers will say that the team has momentum, right? They have momentum going for them. The other team calls a timeout to sort of break that momentum. Well, with all this running we see on Easter Sunday, that was a kind of momentum too, resurrection momentum. All this energy, all this determination unleashed by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we felt that here on Easter Sunday, last week's Sunday. And now, we're surely gonna wanna keep that Easter momentum going. What might that look like? It would look like this, I think, that we can't hear resurrection stories often enough, both the resurrection stories we read in the Gospels, but also resurrection stories people tell today about the new life that Jesus Christ has given them. We want to experience, if we have resurrection momentum, more and more of the richness of life in Jesus Christ. We want to get to know Christ even better. We want Jesus to see, uh, others to see Jesus in us. And the Spirit drives that kind of res resurrection momentum. Well, here's how the Apostle Paul reminds these Philippian Christians as to just how precious the gospel of Jesus Christ is. And Paul does that by making it very personal. He shares his story, his experience, what he saw and heard and learned once he met Jesus. He personalizes the gospel, which we all can do, of course. And Paul describes where and how and why Jesus Christ was at the very center of his life. Now, he goes back to the gospel he taught them and said, you know what? Before I saw Jesus and met him and came to believe in him, I was just like these other false teachers who were coming to town. But you know what? He said, if they think they have a story to tell about how you can keep the works of the law and gain righteousness with God that way, well, I can outdo them. I have a better story than they do. If someone thinks they have reasons for confidence in the flesh. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a Jew of Jews from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee, as to the law, faultless. Paul's credentials were impeccable. He was, as they say in sports today, the goat, greatest of all time, the G-O-A-T, the goat. And Paul was as good a Pharisee as any of them. When the religious leaders were looking for someone who would track down Christians who were escaping from Jerusalem. You gotta track these people down, they have to be arrested. 
They said, we have to bring them back here. They have to go to trial. We have to lock them up. Uh, we need somebody to take the lead on that. And Saul, as he was known then, later Paul, said, I can do that. I'm willing to do that. And he did. And he was so sure of himself. He was so convinced that he was right. So confident, so proud of his religious status. Paul persecuted Christians with zeal. Until he met Jesus. And that changed everything. Verse 7, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And he goes on to say it a little bit different way in verse 8. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I consider all these other things rubbish, or as the message puts it, I dumped it all in the trash. Now, if you were to somehow dive into Paul's dumpster and go through his trash, you would probably find some pretty nice stuff. Say, Paul, you're not getting rid of this, are you? You're not throwing that out. That, that's worth something. What about this award? See this big trophy you got when you finished in the top of your class in Hebrew school? Nope. Get rid of it. Throw it in the dumpster. That's not important to me anymore. Sometimes that rubbish would be on the surface very good stuff. I, I took a few courses at Western Seminary uh, back oh, about 20 years ago, a little bit more, around the turn of the century, actually, around the year 2000. And they orientated us to the, um, to the um, you know, library and how to utilize a library and make the most of it and that kind of thing. And they told us the story of their card catalogs. Now, if you're under around, I don't know, 30, you have no idea what a card catalog is, do you? But it used to be when you went to the library, when I was a kid, we went to Herrick Public Library in uh, Holland and when I was a kid, and they had all these card catalogs because every book in that library had its own card. And the first one would be you know, under the letter A, letters A through C, and then you go on, and some of you remember that, right? And you look through a card catalog to find the book you want and where it would be on the shelf. And Herrick, I mean, not Herrick, but uh, the Western Library had like six stories. It was, it was all tens and hundreds of thousands of volumes in that, and they all had their own card in that card catalog. And these cards were kept in a magnificent card catalog. Every drawer, work of art, beautiful. Every book had its place. These card catalogs in the, Hope li in the, in the Western Library were, were made of the finest wood. They were elegant, probably donated by somebody. Mahogany, maybe, I don't know, but they looked terrific. Wow, they were proud of that card catalog, as we were told in the library when I was studying there. They were impressive until computers came along. And overnight, all those expensive card catalogs became junk. What do you do with card catalogs, row after row of card catalogs? What do you do with that once you have computers? Yeah, hard to say. Uh, nobody wanted them. They tried to sell them. There were no buyers. Finally, a farmer bought them, and he used them to store feed in his hen house. Okay, that's what happens <laughs> when you have something become obsolete. Nobody wants it. Paul had wanted to leave his past behind. Once you've taken to heart the stories of Good Friday and Easter, once you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, all the other stuff, even good stuff, that otherwise would seem to be very important to you, all of that becomes very unimportant. Garbage, Paul says. It pales in comparison. The kind of stuff that we might otherwise be uh, tempted to tell others about, stuff that makes us feel kind of important, or maybe uh, successful. 
you know, have your picture taken with somebody famous and you put that in a very prominent place in your home. You had your picture taken with her? Yeah, oh yeah, I did. Or, or maybe a picture of you at the top of Mount Everest. You climb Mount Everest? Um, yeah, oh yeah, I climbed that a few years ago. Pretty cool, yeah, all right. So we have all these accomplishments. And, and probably it makes for a very interesting conversation. But all of that is merely about us. And once you know the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ, none of that matters. Here in the church, we leave all our accomplishments at the door because we are so keenly aware here when we stand beneath the cross of Jesus, we are so keenly aware that we have so much to be humble about. Here in the church, it's all about the surpassing worth, Paul says, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Last week, we talked about Easter. Jesus is alive again. The Lord who died is risen, and he lives forever. And that changed the world for us, didn't it? Because now we're living our lives every day in the land of the risen king. So Paul says in verse 10, I want to know Christ, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. What's so remarkable, you see, about Easter is not only this, that Jesus, who was dead, is alive again and alive forever. Yes, Jesus won the victory over sin and death and the grave. Our Savior lives and reigns forever, but it's not just his victory, it's ours too. Yes, we win too. In Colossians 3, Paul says, you have been raised with Christ to a new life. Jesus lives, and so do we. Now, looking at verses 10 and 11, I think it might be helpful to think in terms of, of bookends. Just picture a row, a shelf of, of books, and you got a bookend on each side. And, and the bookend, of course, holds the books in place and keeps them from falling over and so on. The Christian life comes with bookends. There's something that holds the Christian life together to keep us in place, to keep us standing, to keep us going on with God. And here's what holds the Christian life up. One bookend on the one side is the resurrection of Jesus where Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That's the first bookend. That's what gets us started. We have life in Jesus now. And, and that's what holds us up. That's what keeps us going. No matter what's going on in our lives at the moment, yes, but I'm, I'm someone who has been raised with Christ. But then Paul goes on next to say, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. Really, that too, huh? Not just resurrection life, but the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. And that surely gets at what Jesus was talking about in the Gospels about the cost of discipleship, the cost of going a second, third mile with someone, the cost of sacrificial love, the cost of interrupting our schedules to spend time with hurting people. So that's the situation now between the bookends. So we have this first bookend, the resurrection of Jesus, and then in the meantime, we have holding us up in our sufferings and the challenges of life, that life in Christ that goes on. But then there's another bookend on the other side. That hasn't happened yet. But that other bookend is also a resurrection bookend. That's the other side. That's what holds the Christian life together. The resurrection of Jesus, Jesus, of Jesus on one side and the resurrection of the body at the end of time on the other side. We have a resurrection we're celebrating, but we're expecting a whole lot more resurrections to come. So Paul adds, so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. So think of it this way. Our lives are held in place by resurrections. There's been a resurrection that happened already. That changed everything for us because Christ's grave was empty. He had risen from the dead. 
But there are also a lot more resurrections on the horizon. Yes, more resurrections are coming. There's a resurrection in our past, but there are going to be many more resurrections in our future, all because Jesus is risen from the dead. So how's that going to happen? Paul doesn't give us any details as to how that's going to happen. He uses the word somehow, which kind of jumps out at us when we read the passage, somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. He's not intending surely to express any doubt about that resurrection. It's just that it, it, it I don't know, what can you say? It blows your mind. It, it's just something beyond anything we can possibly imagine because we know what happens to bodies that are buried or cremated. We know what happens when bodies disintegrate and they return to dust, as the Bible says. And yet, at the end of time, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. The mortal, that's us, we're mortal, will be clothed with immortality. And so that's the future. That's the second bookend. All those resurrections that are still coming. There is no doubt about that. This is truth that stretches so far beyond our understanding, we can't wrap our minds around it, but we're going to have resurrection bodies. There's a, there are a lot more resurrections coming. When you go to a cemetery, think about all those resurrections that are ahead. Resurrection bodies. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised. Resurrection bodies, including those who are now at home with the Lord, never subject to pain or death forever. Okay, so now we find ourselves, in the meantime, living between these two resurrection bookends. We already have new life. Already. We are raised with Christ. But there's so much more yet to come. And that's why, in the meantime, Paul says, this is what I do. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love that phrase, press on. When I visit people, sometimes I, I'll use that phrase in a, making the visit and say, what can we do? We press on, right? And they say, yep, that's what we're doing. We're pressing on, and that's how we live, and that's how we keep going. We, we press on, and this pressing on is all about resurrection momentum. We get our energy we get our perseverance from Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul says Christ has already taken hold of us. Oh, to be sure, for now we're feeble, we still struggle, but we have this gift of being held. What a gift that is. The gift of being held by the Lord. The gift of being led. And that happens for a lifetime. You are always held you are always being led. God has you in his grip. As one pastor put it, when Christ takes hold of you, when Christ takes hold of you, and he has, it is an experience so rich, it will take you an eternity to figure out all that you have received. But that's who we are as people held by God in Christ. We are already people who are in Christ when our faith is in him. But at the same time, we still have so much more to learn, don't we? We still have so much more growing to do. There are still experiences yet that are ahead of us, and probably for most of us, there's going to be more losses along the way, too. These are things that we have to go through for now. We suffer for a little while. They'll teach us more about trusting in the Lord. In the meantime, we need to get more practice at praying your kingdom come so that we're praying your kingdom come more and more fervently than ever. And when we get caught up in this resurrection momentum, we're going to want to keep it going. This insatiable craving for more. I want to learn more about the Bible. I want to grow more in my Savior. I want to love people more and more than ever. I want to know Christ, Paul says, and we echo that. Yes, I want to know Christ too. 
more and more and more. I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. A pastor named Thomas Long tells the story about a a professor and physician, a professor of medicine and a physician named Dr. Lewis Thomas. And Dr. Thomas wrote some memoirs about his experience, and in his book he writes about his early days as a new professor of medicine at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. In the book, he tells the story of one of his students in those early days of being a professor, an intern, a resident, who was assigned to a patient who was desperately ill with pneumonia, advanced pneumonia, and with meningitis. And he was so dedicated to that patient. He kept running in that room to see how he was doing. He spent half the night awake going back and forth between the patient and then you know, contacting consultants and infectious diseases. Anything else I can try, what else can I do? He tried everything he could think of, but this patient died. And shortly thereafter, he had to give a formal presentation in his class at the hospital about this case and what he did and how he attacked it and what he tried to do and everything. And as he was doing, doing that, the tears were just streaming down his cheeks. And Dr. Lewis Thomas was there taking this all in, was the teacher of that class. And he wrote in his memoir, I knew that these were tears, not of frustration, but tears of grief. And that's when I realized for the first time what kind of hospital I was in. Now, when Thomas Long writes about this memoir and what this doctor shared, he made this observation, which I think fits in beautifully with Philippians chapter 3. He said, this young intern had a life, not a lifestyle, but a life, A, a life that sent him into situations he could not fix and led him to pour out his all for people he could not heal. A lifestyle is different than a life. A lifestyle is all about personal preferences, about preferences, well, clothing, and what styles you want to wear. A lifestyle is about the car you drive, the music you listen to, the food you like to eat, the the restaurants you eat in or perhaps won't go to because either that fits or it doesn't fit with our choices in our lifestyle. We invest a ton of energy and a a ton of time in, in trying to achieve our lifestyles. We devote our weekends to our lifestyles. We plan trips around our lifestyles, and we tend to gravitate to people and hang out with people whose lifestyle choices are a lot like ours. That's a lifestyle. But a life, on the other hand, A life is different. A a life is central to who we are. A a life is what we're willing to sacrifice for. A life makes us do what we feel called to do regardless of the cost. A life, that connects with the deepest longings and deepest places in our hearts. A lifestyle is about choices. A life is a matter of calling. A, A life gives us experiences we probably never would have chosen. Now, what Paul describes for us here in Philippians 3 is a life, not a lifestyle, a life. To be a follower of Jesus Christ is not about picking and choosing what we feel like doing, what suits us, what doesn't suit us, uh, what is our thing and what we prefer not to get involved with and how we want to spend our free time and all the rest. That's a lifestyle. A lifestyle is about what we choose to love and what people we choose to love and what we choose to avoid and all that sort of thing. But being a Christian with a life, that's a different story. To be a Christian is to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us. That's what we're doing. That describes 
We trust every day of our lives we're taking hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of us. And as he has taken hold of us and as he has us in his grip, so we go where he leads us and we do what he wants us to do wherever that takes us. So, so catch this resurrection momentum. Take Paul's words here in Philippians 3 into your heart and make them deeply personal for yourself. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. That's not about a lifestyle. That's about a life. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we bow our hearts to you. We want to live as children of the resurrection. We want to live in the land of the resurrection. Lord, we don't want just lifestyles. We want a life. And we want that life to be in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We pray, O oh Lord, that in Christ we will live and move and have our being. We pray that you will fill us with that kind of resurrection momentum where we can echo Paul, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings and somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Lord, there are resurrect there's a resurrection in our past. There will be a lot more resurrections in our future. In the meantime, Lord, help us to choose that kind of life that is centered on our living Savior with the anticipation of all that he will yet do for us. Yes, Lord, hear our prayer and help us through the energy of your spirit to press on, to go forward with you and to rest in that deep assurance that we are always being held. And yes, Lord, we hope for the rest of our lives and for all eternity to grasp more and more what it is to take hold of him who has taken hold of us. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to sing.
feel the resurrection momentum? I hope you do. Following the service, if you would like to be prayed for, you have a concern, something for joy you want to share, whatever, there'll be some prayer volunteers up front. Please come up and pray with us. In the ark, go to the prayer corner. Or either you can contact prayer at heritage.org and uh, you can share prayer requests that way as well. But we leave from here with our hearts open and our hands open to the Lord because we're going to be blessed. We're going to be blessed today. We're going to be blessed for this week, for a lifetime, and forever because we are the people who have been raised with Christ and there are more resurrections in our futures. What a future we have. In light of all that, receive the Lord's blessing. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. And all God's people say, Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>